My name is Yael Ryan. I am APAC's Director of Venture Tech. We're glad you're able to join us for APAC Tech Digital Discussion on Israel's tech boom in the United States and excited to feature two experts in the tech ecosystem who will provide us a deeper analysis of the shared values, partnerships, and cross collaborations held between Israel and the United States. This call will feature two experts in the space, Inon Elroy, Israel's Economic Minister to North America, and Daniel Frankenstein, partner and co-founder of Janvest Capital Partners. First and foremost, thank you, Inon and Daniel, for, for joining us on this call today. Thanks very much for uh, having us. Excited to uh, be here and just want to echo your comments of hoping everyone's staying healthy and safe during what is a unprecedented time. Fantastic. So let's start off our first question really at the 100 foot level. So the US's relationship is one of great strength and has traditionally been looked at through the lens of military cooperation. Looking beyond that, how has the relationship grown through a technology perspective, especially as Israel has showcased its dominance as a leader in the tech industry? Let's start off with you first, Yunan. Uh, I hope. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, hello and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I, I'm really thrilled to be, to be here with you. Uh, I think that the, uh, speaking of the importance of the relationships between our countries uh, involve many more sectors than only the, the defense, if you like. We can uh, think of energy, transportation, life science, uh, cyber, fintech, etc. Uh, take into consideration that um, there are at least 350 uh, multinationals uh, in Israel where about 70% of them are U.S. corporations. In addition to that, there are around 1,200 Israeli companies, mostly startups, that uh, the majority of them are located in uh, New York and California areas, which signal a very important uh, economic and technological partnerships. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, if I may say with all the modesty, this is not the David and Goliath uh, scenario. Uh, I would also like to, um, to mention that investments into Israeli startups is at uh, all time uh, high, uh, specifically in areas like Sabbath security where one in uh, eight dollars uh, invested goes to uh, Israeli startups. And of course, this is also includes digital health that has become very, very uh, hot. Uh, topic these days, smart mobilities. And think about it, many of uh, the investors are coming from the US. They are the major part of uh, funding, uh, both uh, in the Israeli uh, VC and uh, tech companies. You may always also like into take into consideration <clears throat> that uh, since quite many years, there's uh, quite uh, diverse platforms of memorandum of understanding between the Israeli uh, Innovation Authority, the former chief scientist uh, for people who knew that uh, in that name. And recently we are, we've been very thrilled to uh, promote the, the, the cooperation between Jefferson University in Philadelphia, uh, Hartford the Healthcare, and also with the New York uh, State and this uh, uh, cooper specific cooperation going to be emphasized on uh, solutions for smart cities. I would also like to say that the U.S.-Israeli uh, Bird Foundation, this is a bilateral R&D platforms between the states, uh, which have been supported joint technological cooperation between the U.S. and Israeli companies, uh, has, has created mutual value uh, for the last 44 years. You may think of uh, more than $900 uh, million dollars that were uh, invested uh, through this uh, fund. Sorry, uh, 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 about three hundred million dollars in more than nine hundred uh, projects. Lastly, you know we can take one example. For example, uh, Teva uh, is very critical to the sustainability of U.S. healthcare system uh, by driving nearly forty forty two billion dollars in saving each year, providing quality and affordable genetic generic uh, medicines. Uh, there are also 57,000 American jobs here in manufacturing and R&D and commercial functions. So I think this is a very fruitful uh, uh, relations, if you like. Thank you. Daniel, how about yourself? What, what's your take on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I would echo everything that Eno mentioned and, and say that, you know, not only is the U.S. the most prolific capital market in the history of the world and a great destination for anyone wanting to grow a business, but we can't underscore sort of the cultural understanding and the real friendship that our two countries have um, was one of the major reasons why so many Israeli companies locate here to the U.S., um, you know, one of the questions that investors don't ask their founders about relocation is where does your family want to live um, for a period of time? Where where are you going to have a community? Where are you going to have, you know, a great basis to um, actually be able to focus on your business where your kids are happy in school? Um, and so there's a huge amount, and, and you know, mentioned some of the numbers, not only are there, you know, 200 plus multinational U.S. companies on the ground in Israel, but you know, more than a thousand Israeli companies domiciled um, here in the U.S. Um, and you know, this is where their customers are, this is where their investors are, and this is where their acquirers are. Um, and I think that um, you know, it's a huge, unbelievable transfer between um, you know our two countries. The the last thing I'll mention on this point is um, this uh, has really achieved maturity in the last couple of years. Um, I got started in the um, uh, investment business in Israel almost a decade ago, uh, where when we would talk to folks here in the U.S. market about Israeli technology, they would say things like, oh, I hear there's a lot of good stuff going on there. Or, um, you know, oh, we, we know of some things coming out of Israel. In the last two years, three years, there's not a single investment fund. There's not a single large multinational. There's not a single technology company that doesn't have some real commercial connection to Israeli technology. Um, and it's not just in the security space, it's in a lot of different diverse industries. So I think the um, interconnected nature of our ecosystems is one of the great strengths of the US-Israel relationship that goes well beyond defense and it goes well beyond politics. Right. Well, I actually wanted to push back a little bit more, not really push back, but really just continue on to, to the sentiment that you were building upon was just that a lot of Israeli tech companies have expanded their efforts here in the United States and have set up shop across this country. I'd like to hear a little bit more from, from the both of you about how Israel's tech influence has changed the startup scene in the United States. How has this had an effect on startup culture, talent, education, and more across this country? I, I think there's an incredible... Um, affinity for Israeli entrepreneurs. If you look in Silicon Valley, if you look here in New York, um, you know, Israeli entrepreneurs are widely seen as efficient, scrappy, very talented, very technical, coming with um, different ways of solving problems. Um, and, and so, you know, I think it has, it, you, you don't have a tech ecosystem in the United States today without there being a huge amount of Hebrew being spoken. Um, you know, there's, there's jokes that there are particular Starbucks locations in Silicon Valley where um, the native language in the Starbucks is Hebrew. Um, you know, you can't go into a co-working space in New York City without hearing Hebrew. Um, so, so I would say that it's not just, I would even take it a step further, Yale, I would say it's not just that um, the Israeli tech ecosystem has had effect has had an effect on the U.S. tech ecosystem. I would say they're now as interconnected, almost one ecosystem, um, which, you know, as, a, as an observer of the politics and the changing politics and sometimes the fractured politics, it's always interesting to watch and have this front row seat to this unbelievable integration of our two countries and of the business communities where they truly do function as one. Um, and, uh, and there is so much that goes back and forth. You know, what's your take on this? I, I, I support and I echo what, uh, Daniel just mentioned. I think it's very, we, we find it very, uh, you know, um, easy sometimes or, or even funny that uh, when we reach out to uh, help to Israeli companies here and we find <clears throat> someone that you would not imagine that have any experience or, family in Israel, and he tells or she tells us, yeah, I know how it works. Uh, I've been working for two years with an Israeli company in Boston or in New York or in California. And uh, okay, so you need it yesterday and uh, you don't like the process and, uh, uh, and, and you call uh, the prime minister Bibi. 
So uh, in a way, I think that we see that, uh, that these bonds and, and the presence of Israeli companies here, as well as uh, uh, the, the work of Israeli, Israelis in uh, you know, the R&D centers in Israel, that, brings, uh, that, that creates a lot of, of, of bridges, that, that brings a lot of uh, uh, understanding, and I think that there's another, another phenomena that, you, that we would like maybe to, to, to look at. Because, you know, uh, many years ago, or maybe not too many years ago, New York, New York was not uh, uh, branded as a startup uh, center. It was not the technology center of the U.S. <clears throat> and, and ever since I think they, they've done, I mean, you've done a great job. Uh, and I'm not the one to give uh, marks, but in a way, thinking about that, that there's, I don't know, every number will be right, 400 Israeli companies here, uh, I'm sure that's also uh, contributed its, uh, its uh, effort to that, to the, to the new phenomenon of having uh, New York and, and New York City as, a, as an evolving uh, tech uh, uh, giant these days. And I think that uh, in addition to that, when we see uh, an interesting list of different uh, Israeli, and I, I, I would pick the word accelerators, but maybe some of them would not like it. So, so I'm, I, I apologize if somebody would not like it. Uh, but several of them have chosen New York to launch kind of startup platforms. And we can speak about Sosa, we can speak about 365X, uh, we can speak about Iconic of uh, Eyal, and of course, uh, JVP. So all these uh, uh, um, platforms, they, they launch uh, new companies uh, every, every year or every several months. They bring new Israelis to, to, the, uh, to the market and they recruit uh, local, local uh, teams uh, to, to work with these uh, entrepreneurs. So, so clearly uh, there's a lot of synergies and, and, and I believe that these uh, uh, joint efforts bring a lot of uh, uh, value uh, and development for all, all the sites. And we can speak about, you know, both cyber and fintech. We can speak about digitalization and, and food tech. Uh, th these may be uh, these uh, sectors which develop by this, uh, this platform. So I think uh, we should take into consideration all these things together. So you both touched on this, but I'd like to expand a little bit more onto the topic about the role that the U.S. public sector is playing to sustain growth amongst the tech ecosystem or amongst the Israeli tech ecosystem across this country. Um, JVP, the cyber center uh, in New York is one example, but we'd love to hear a little bit more about different examples that we're seeing across this country where the U.S. is playing more of a substantial role in sustaining growth amongst Israeli tech companies. So, uh, you know, it would not be surprising that the U.S. is the largest market for most of the Israeli entrepreneurs, so they are always trying to expand uh, in, this, uh, in this state beforehand, and clearly New York City is the most desirable for market for most of these companies. So as you said, I think that uh, during the recent years, we saw at least four examples of Israeli organizations that took advantage of economic development policies of uh, New York, both uh, New York State and uh, New York City. And we can uh, uh, you know, speak about firstly about uh, uh, the Technion with its uh, joint venture with uh, Cornell Tech on uh, Governor's Island. We may speak of uh, Sosa, which is one of the eight uh, uh, operators uh, for the New York City uh, Cyber Center. Uh, similarly, uh, JVP was the uh, second Israeli operator for this uh, uh, initiative. And maybe lastly, in this context, uh, Team 8, just, uh, which is uh, uh, an Israeli uh, think tank in the cyber ecosystem and uh, a platform for creation of companies, uh, have been uh, re recruited, as far as I understand, as consultant for, for uh, NYC EDC. Uh, on the other hand, one could consider the health sector uh, as, as mostly the public one. Many Israeli digital health companies are contracting solutions to optimize and support uh, the operations of uh, American hospitals and, and others. Uh, another example could be you know, uh, smart mobility companies like uh, Exilion, which is a uh, technology which coordinates uh, streetlights with uh, road vehicles, prioritizing uh, public transit 
uh, options like buses. So they had a pilot uh, with uh, the New York authorities for the uh, uh, Fifth Avenue when there was a traffic and we all hope that there will be a lot of traffic there soon or later, sooner than later. And maybe uh, uh, another example is of uh, diagnostic robotics, which is selling to the state of Rhode Island, a uh, self-diagnostic tool for residents who think they may have had uh, the, the pandemic. So these could be some examples of that. And, and just, to, just to touch on that, you know, it's not just places like New York that are putting public policy initiatives together to encourage, in particular, Israeli companies to relocate. You know, we, had a, we have a portfolio company of ours um, that relocated to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, why St. Louis? They are a company in the remote monitoring and smart sensor connectivity business. And a lot of their customers are large industrials, power companies, um, and, and so many of their clients are in the Midwest. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of these initiatives around the country. And I think if you zoom out, um, you know, you might want to ask, why are U.S. public sector dollars going to support bringing Israeli companies and helping them relocate and fund those companies as they come to the U.S.? Um, the, the short answer is, it's good business. Um, you know, we think about the... Um, we think about this U.S.-Israel relationship and, you know, foreign military assistance that Israel gets every year from the United States, I think through too narrow of a lens. I think we think about it through this lens of little Israel surrounded by hostile neighbors, uh, the most beautiful house in the worst neighborhood in the world, um, needs our help. And I don't want to undersell that, um, that they do. But what I want to make the additional point of is it's a great investment. Um, if you think about the, um, you know, the fact that Israel has the third largest number of publicly traded companies in the United States for a foreign country behind Canada and China. If you think about the more than a thousand Israeli companies domiciled in some way, shape or form in the United States, those companies hire Americans. <clears throat> those companies pay taxes in America. Those companies sell their products to U.S. companies that are safe, making um, U.S. companies more safe and secure, um, providing them advanced data solutions, artificial intelligence solutions, not, mention, not to mention security solutions. But at the end of the day, um, the U.S. is getting a bargain because all of these Israeli companies are coming here. <clears throat> they're hiring people and paying taxes here. And I just think it's important to recognize that um, <clears throat> this U.S.-Israel relationship is not just one of political shared values, but one of really good shared business and profit objectives. Um, it is really good for the United States to be the destination for econ <clears throat> economically minded Israelis relocating to um, the market of their choice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, we're seeing how the U.S. is a relationship is expanding beyond just military and defense and technology is really that skeleton key that's driving that forward. And it's incredible to see uh, just the breadth and the ex expansive nature of this relationship through the perspective of technology. And that really just brings me to my next question. And this next question is geared a little bit more specifically to Enon. Uh, as the Israeli economic minister, you're hosting a variety of different delegations of entrepreneurs from Israel that are looking to do business here in the United States. How have your efforts changed in light of this new reality that we're seeing with COVID? And how have you adjusted your efforts specifically with this new environment, as well as, you know, give us a little bit more of an overview of the work that you've been doing over the past few years as the Israeli economic minister with regards to bringing Israeli tech companies to this to the States? Thank you. So uh, the, the, the pre-COVID-19 the pre -COVID era was uh, defined in uh, quite a systematic work of uh, us bringing companies for roadshows with uh, different uh, locations. We can bring, uh, we, we brought, you know, a digital health delegation to Boston, to Philadelphia, to uh, New York City, and to Atlanta or, or, or Miami. Uh, and, and we also used to participate in all the major uh, conferences as, as, as a, a, a platform, which means that whenever there was uh, a regional or national uh, conference like uh, RSA or uh, NRF or even a Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, most of my 
counterparts and myself would work in order to identify the uh, people from their location, from their, uh, for in, in our case, from the East Coast, which will travel to Mobile World Congress or to RSA or whatever, and we propose them uh, to meet with relevant Israeli companies. So uh, this is not uh, valid anymore. And uh, if you uh, look and review um, the uh, announcements of different uh, American uh, companies like Microsoft, uh, Salesforce, Facebook, IBM, and others, uh, not sure that they are going to participate in, these, in such mega events uh, until at least until uh, summer 2021. So, uh, what does it says? What does it? Uh, what's going to be with the market? What about the people that uh, have these uh, exhibition, uh, you know, uh, conferences, uh, locations, and 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 many others that used to work for them, be transportation, hotels, and whatever. Now, as uh, it relates to us, what we try to do is uh, uh, to work in, I would say three main um, um, vectors. One, we're doing uh, generic or sectorial uh, webinars. We had uh, three webinars on digital health, one with Shiba and five Israeli companies. Shiba was identified or credited, credited by uh, the Business Week, if I'm not mistaken, as one of the 10 more best uh, hospitals in the world. So uh, we, we, we organized together with them two webinars, one for the hotels, uh, hospitals, sorry, uh, community, and the second for together with uh, uh, an operator of nursing home in Israel, Amal, uh, we've, we've launched uh, a webinar specifically on, on nursing homes together with six companies. Last week, we had a, a government to government webinar with the Ministry of Health presenting to the different governors, uh, teams, uh, DOHs, and uh, first responders, the Hamagen uh, application uh, that was developed by the Ministry of Health. By the way, Israel proposed this uh, uh, platform free of charge. It's, uh, it's, an, uh, it's, an on, 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 you know, it's an open source, and, and we propose it to the different governors and, and governments to use it. In addition, we, propose, we presented uh, a platform, a prediction platform by uh, the Weizmann Institute that could help us to predict where going to be the next hotspot. hotspot. Imagine that uh, it's going to be tomorrow in Chelsea, so you don't have to close all Manhattan in order to make sure that it, uh, it will be, uh, you know, it will not be uh, uh, growing. So in a way, that's what we're trying to do on the, on the uh, I would say this vector. We're doing private webinars with different companies that may need specific uh, things today for business continuity, for uh, robotics, for, uh, I don't know, uh, customer relations. And lastly, we're doing, uh, as, as always, we try to help Israeli companies that approach us uh, with specific uh, requests. Thank you. Great. The, the power of Zoom or webinars have been really uh, quite astounding with what we've been seeing over these past few months. Uh, my question next is, is for Daniel specifically. Um, the past few days have been actually quite exciting for Israeli technology. This weekend, the U.S. company Intel announced that it is set to acquire Israeli's tech startup MoveIt for about a billion dollars. Uh, Double Secret Octopus, which is a password-free authentication startup, raised around $15 million. And about two weeks ago, AI be behavior biometric startup Biocatch announced that it raised around $145 million from investors. What is unique here for these startups that are currently raising capital? And Daniel, through your perspective as a venture capitalist, is this a unique situation in comparison to what other startups are currently experiencing during this time specifically? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And we have some <clears throat> unique insight. My, um, my firm, Janvis Capital, we were the seat money into Biocatch. Um, so sort of watched um, this all come together uh, uh, during, during this time. You know, I would say that, um, you know, the last few years and this bull market that we've had um, has been quite the last few years for the venture industry. Um, there has been a huge explosion in terms of number of investment funds. Um, and there's also been, um, you know, just more, not only more funds, but 
larger funds. Um, those larger funds are writing larger checks and not to get too wonky and kind of deep into the weeds here, but you've had this kind of ecosystem where it's, a, it's fairly easy for good businesses to raise money at, you know, some would argue valuations that are um, a little too high. Um, some would argue that they're raising too much money um, at valuations that are too high. And so um, I think that a lot of the rounds that you're seeing and a lot of the transactions that you're seeing getting announced now, these are very much pre-coronavirus rounds that are being completed at this time. But I do think um, you will see both, um, you know, in Israel and, um, and, you know, elsewhere, you know, I think Israel, when it comes to venture financing, actually tracks the U.S. pretty well. Um, I think you're going to see some of that activity slow down and some of that activity normalize. Um, but, you know, as a firm ourselves that got started in the midst of the last recession, um, we actually think that an environment of this sort may actually bring some sanity back to the ecosystem. Um, you know, one of the things that people always talk about in the venture world is valuation, which um, sort of in layman's terms is the price at which you buy the stock in a private company. Um, those are always going to go down during times like this. But what actually affects your economic return as an investor is not just valuation, but also the efficiency of the investment. Said another way, how little does the company have to raise in private financing to achieve an end result? In a world where there's a lot of money that's pretty easy to take at, and, and, and you know the amount of money being taken by your average company goes up, that really depreciates the economic return for an investor. So a time like this obviously has a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, but the ability for investors to realize a more significant return because they're not only going to benefit from slightly lower valuations, but also from companies operating more efficiently, um, I think actually makes it a very interesting time to be a venture capitalist and to be out in market. And, and we are very much out in market right now because of, of, of this market dynamic. It's an incredibly fascinating point. Um, something that I've actually been thinking about over the past few weeks, and this is applicable both to you and Enone, is that as Israel starts to reopen its schools and ease coronavirus restrictions, how do you think certain companies with both a U.S. and an Israeli presence will adapt and adjust to, to work in tandem with one another as one, art, one market begins to reopen and then the other one is still under stay-at-home ruling? Let's start off with you first, Enone. Thanks. So, so I think it's a it's it's a little bit tricky to to give a general answer because it's uh, uh, first of all we don't really know what what will happen in, in two weeks time. Second, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, difference between different sectors. Everything which is uh, related to business continuity, in a way, uh, we see quite a lot of uh, bandwidth quite a lot of most of the employees uh, will be, and especially with, with you know, high tech and, 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 and startups and whatever. So we see quite a lot of uh, demand, clearly anything which got to do to digital health, etc. cetera. Um, it will be also interesting to see what's going on with the physical presence. Will companies continue to take advantage of this uh, digital uh, era that have just uh, enforced on us? You hear about uh, different companies like Google and others that they, they claim that they will uh, ask their employees to continue to work from home. So probably, you know, uh, uh, digital meetings, as you, as you said before, they, they continue to be the, the, the trend and the bon ton because you would not be able to, to meet with people because maybe they are upstate uh, New York or in Connecticut or, or, or in uh, Denver, I don't know. So. Uh, uh, in this context, I think it's hard to say. The most challenging thing for me uh, would be uh, uh, with people that have uh, small kids, uh, younger kids, because there's no solution. 
and even the remote uh, the remote education you cannot have an eight years old uh, clearly not four years old sitting in front uh, of his or her computer uh, during a couple hours alone and therefore the parents gonna be very challenged about it this is why I also think that uh, the way uh, the, the governors of, uh, of New York, New Jersey, uh, and, and other states in the area, when they claim that uh, reopening should be a regional reopening, it makes a lot of sense to me because it doesn't make too much sense that New York will open, but the schools of New Jersey will be closed, and so many people are working in Manhattan, but they live in New Jersey, so what, what are you going to do with the kids? So it doesn't make a lot of sense. I hope I've answered. Yeah, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, you know, uh, Israeli companies in general um, are used to doing a lot of their initial interactions, um, you know, both with customers and remote employees via Zoom. Um, you know, I have a partner in Tel Aviv. Uh, we Zoom three times a week. Uh, and you know this is this is our normal. We do a lot of video conferencing. I'm on eight boards. Um, uh, six of those eight companies have board meetings in Tel Aviv. If I can't be there in person, I'm on Zoom. Um, there's a lot of ways to to do that. So I think Israeli companies generally are more um, are more used to remote communication and remote work with their customers and or you know colleagues uh, across the world and in the U.S. Um, specifically because, um, uh, you know, there's, that they are used to being far from their market. The other uh, phenomena is that um, I've always found Israelis to be a lot more understanding of a work-home balance um, than, uh, you know, folks in the U.S. You know, there's stories of, you know, um, you know, somebody in Israel bringing their kid to class because, um, they couldn't find childcare, and the professor holding the kid so that the the mother could take notes, um, or uh, you know a story of you know someone bringing their kid to an interview in Israel because you know grandma couldn't watch him that day, and that just being kind of something that happens. I think a lot of the taboos with that, and Enon sort of mentioned this that you know I've got a five year old and a and a and a ten month old, and um, you know, the, the, the balancing of all of this, I think, is tough. And I think that, um, you know, we're moving a little closer culturally um, to, I think, an understanding that folks have to balance. Um, the last thing I'll mention um, is more of a macro uh, 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 observation. And that is that, um, you know, we're in sort of a venture ecosystem here in the U.S., despite the fact that my firm exclusively focuses on Israeli startups. Um, so we do have an opportunity to benchmark our experience with Israeli startups and the experience of our American counterparts who are investing um, in, um, uh, in um, you know, exclusively American businesses. And I would say in general, Israeli companies are um, used to interruptions. They're used to needing to have redundancies in place. And this doesn't come from the geopolitical challenges and sometimes conflict, although that's part of it. It's mostly because, um, you know, Israelis have military reserve duty obligations called miluim. And that means you as a startup could have your key product person called to the military for two weeks with, at a moment's notice, um, and you still have to meet a customer deadline. Uh, and so how do you do that? And so I think a lot of our portfolio companies are used to having to have these plans on this person isn't available, this person isn't in the office, this person has other obligations. Um, you know, so we're seeing across our portfolio, and again, we're, we're probably a little bit insulated in the sense that we only invest in deep technology software. We do not have hardware products, we don't have interrupted supply chains, we don't have logistics that have issues, we're not dealing in highly regulated environments where you have a lot of stoppages, especially at the public policy level. Um, so I would just say in, in general, um, I think that Israeli companies are very used to a kind of a more unsettled environment. Um, and I think you're gonna see long-term those businesses be able to um, find the opportunity that always exists in, in any sort of a crisis. 
Right, exactly. We're, we're seeing that Israeli tech companies or founders are a lot more flexible, and through that, that flexibility leads to their own ultimate success, which is uh, remarkable to see. Uh, my last question, and we actually have a really active uh, chat, so we're going to get to audience Q&A quickly after that. But if anyone has any questions, just a heads up, write those questions into the chat box, and we'll hopefully have the time to get to those questions. Um, but this is my last question for, for the two of you. While many companies and startups are unfortunately hitting hard times, there are certain companies and sectors that have shown exponential growth during the time, and we've definitely spoken about that. Um, but one company specifically is Netflix, which has seen its stock rise ahead of its earnings reports and has seen a rise in subscriber growth. What specific Israeli tech companies based in the United States have you seen grow exponentially? And this is beyond just raising capital. This is just user growth um, uh, during this time. And in your, in, your, in your opinion, do you see that growth to be sustainable once we resume back to our daily lives? I, I can take a quick stab at this. I, I would say, you know, when we are vetting businesses, um, you know, we look for sustainable companies building sustainable products. Um, and I think that, that it's hard to think, and, you know, I was just on a, um, I was just at a panel of a bunch of venture firms and a bunch of institutional investors who invest in those venture firms. Um, you know, and one of the things that the institutional investor said is he said, you know, if you're chasing a business that's seen a dramatic um, increase in their business because of a once in a generation, once in a hundred year event, the question I'm asking is whether that's a sustainable company that I'd want to back at any point. And I think, if you look at some of these larger businesses that have seen their um, the demand for their services go up during a time like this, whether it's um, you know Netflix because of everybody's home, whether it's Amazon because everybody's getting everything delivered, um, the list goes on. I think the underlying commonality between all those companies is they're good businesses no matter what, um, and they're providing a a good service that people want and desire. Um, and are, um, you know, making money for their investors, um, even when it's not a time like this. Um, but I do think that a moment like this, maybe not in the immediacy, but I think the implication of a time like this is we're going to see the next digital revolution. And that's another reason why I think it's very exciting to be out in the venture world right now. Um, you know, as few as six months ago, being a progressive digital business where your employees could access data in a safe and secure way at any time at any place was a nice to have, but not a need to have. Um, having all of your business applications available via cloud delivery was a nice to have, not a need to have. Um, there were businesses that questioned how digital they needed to be. As people ran back to community and finding off and, and being in the office, um, you know, did you need to have all of these advanced digital capabilities? That world is gone. Being digital is a must. Cloud delivery of data is a must. The safe and security of doing that right is a must. And companies are going to be, in large enterprises, are going to be out there investing heavily in the products that are going to allow them to um, really have maximum impact of their workforce, be they in the office or remote, and there should be no difference between the two. So I think from a short-term shock aspect, um, as an investor, I'd actually run away from any business that comes to me and says, oh my goodness, this current circumstance has dramatically changed my business. I'm seeing exponential growth. Well, my first question would be, how sustainable is that? And I can probably answer my own question. But I do believe that companies are going to re-examine their digital infrastructure. They are going to have to digitize that legacy infrastructure. And I think it's going to be a very interesting time um, for both mergers and acquisitions in the next couple of years, as well as, uh, you know, venture private investments. Thanks so much, Daniel. You know, and what's your take on this with regards to where you see Israeli startups specifically growing uh, or have seen a lot of exponential growth, will they continue to sustain that growth in the near future? I think that this is a little bit, as I said, a little bit early to, to predict, but you know, I read, I read uh, an article about uh, Warren Buffett uh, uh, 
leaving his, uh, I mean, the, the, the investment company just sold all their shares in the fourth uh, US uh, airplane, you know, airplanes uh, companies. They sold United, Delta, and whatever. And like two weeks ago, they considered uh, this uh, sector to be very uh, promising because they had like uh, around uh, 10 percent from from each of these companies. So uh, I, I believe that still uh, we will see some changes. <clears throat> we will have to see how the, the trends are are developing. On the other hand, you know, uh, as as mentioned before, uh, thinking about everything which got to do to business. Uh, uh, business continuity, anything that could make uh, uh, medical treatments easier, more efficient, uh, uh, smoother, anything which got to do uh, to robotics, uh, I don't know, companies like uh, uh, Titocare, like uh, uh, Fabric for the, for the uh, robotics, uh, think about uh, diagnostic robotics that we spoke about them beforehand, um, uh, companies like uh, Carbine, which uh, create, uh, uh, you know, 911 uh, uh, centers. And, and, and even surprisingly, uh, I was quite surprised to, to hear from companies that you, that at least me, I would not think that they will flourish in this uh, area, but a company like Snappy, this is a platform that uh, allow you to send anything uh, from a gift to a birthday cake and whatever to either your team members or, or clients, they, they, don't, uh, they, they don't sleep. They work so hard because people, uh, companies, they want to you know, uh, give their employees or the clients uh, like uh, feeling good, so, so they, they order. And, and when I spoke to the CEO, I was sure that she's like going on vacations, not, not that they think that she can go, but still, I thought that uh, they will suffer quite intensively. So we hear from companies, you know, in the media, in the sports tech, in uh, uh, that kind of uh, sectors, which will have to find new or I would say adjust and adapt their business model to the coming uh, uh, reality. Which again, I'm not into the situ into the stage to say what it is, uh, but clearly anything which which will uh, enable us to to create this uh, and to to fulfill this biz business continuity will clearly be uh, of interest and uh, and flourish. So we have a lot of questions from our audience, and I want to make sure that we have time to get to those questions. Uh, our first question that I have uh, is from Lloyd Fishman. His question is, the U.S. represents the largest market and greatest access to capital. How come today is hiring American CEOs based in the United States for companies who keep their operations in Israel? Um, that, that happens really frequently. Um, you know, I think the, the tried and true tested model for really successful Israeli companies um, tends to be uh, uh, when the company moves to the U.S., uh, to have the research and development, the R&D team, the technical team still in Israel, um, and kind of that sales and marketing um, in, in the U.S. Um, and sort of we've, we've found that to be, um, you know, very, um, a very effective way to gain the best business acumen in the United States, um, but also make sure you still have that deep Israeli DNA in terms of product development. I will tell you, though, that you have to be thoughtful in how you do that because um, you know one of the things that uh, that that we like to um, say is that you know the entrepreneurs that we invest in um, that are based in Israel they speak perfect English um, but sometimes not a word of American um, and if you hire an American CEO um, to manage an Israeli business um, he or she may speak perfect Hebrew which probably they don't speak a word of um, but they don't speak a a dollop of Israeli. And so the reality is there's, you have to be very thoughtful that despite our shared values and despite, um, you know, the friendly nature between our countries and the incredible business relationships that exist, there is a cultural gap um, and you have to be thoughtful about that. So actually one of the things that we have found as a really um, sort of successful way to do this, um, first of all, we only back businesses that have at least two founders. Um, that is a, not only a risk mitigator, but also make sure that you have 
kind of a push and a pull and a yin and yang when it comes to development. You can't kind of get in your own head. Um, and when we relocate somebody to the U.S., we want to bring a founder to the U.S. And we want that founder to be the go-between um, between the Israeli team and the American team. Um, that founder has the trust of people on both sides. That founder has the, uh, their own sort of economics tied to a good relationship between both sides. But it's really something that has to be managed effectively. Um, but we have found and have some great success stories. Uh, you know, Yael Biocatch, the company that you mentioned, um, their CEO is based here in New York. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we have some great success stories in that regard. We've also had some of our hiccups where, um, you know, we were too quick to hire an American CEO um, and that wasn't necessarily um, a, the right cultural fit for, for, for the company. So, um, you know, I've found and, and my business has very much been built on Israel has incredible technology. America has incredible capital markets and business acumen. And putting those two things together makes the um, sum greater than the parts, um, but, uh, but it has to be done in a, in, a, in a thoughtful way. Definitely. You know, and what is your take on that? What have you seen with the companies that you've, worf- wor- that you've worked with? So, so I think that, uh, you know, there's different, uh, there's quite a lot of companies, so the, different, the, the models are, are varied from, from the different uh, possibilities. You may find, uh, you know, uh, the, the models of uh, the, the investors asking to have at least one executive uh, officer in, uh, in, in the U.S. And it might be uh, that they would prefer, as long as, uh, as big as the company becomes, you know, they, they, may, they may prefer to have more executive uh, officers here and clearly the marketing, but this is not necessarily the case. Now, you know, as for us, as, as for Israeli government, of course, uh, we would prefer that the maximum and the, the biggest uh, possible team will stay, will stay in Israel. But I think everybody understands that uh, uh, many companies need to be in the market in order to be able to penetrate. And, and, and then, you know, there is quite of a, a combination what, what, where each part of the team could bring must the, the highest value in this context. So we have a question. Sorry, I was just going to add one piece to that because I want to dispel a misnomer about bringing Israeli companies to the U.S. Um, you know, I think there's uh, sort of that follow-up question is, is there a brain drain, right? Are all the best and smartest Israelis coming to the United States? And, um, and you know, how does that affect employment in Israel? And, and I think if you look at the data, um, and, and I'll use the Intel Move It example. You know, Yale, you mentioned that Intel announced that it's going to acquire an Israeli company, Move It, for a billion dollars. Um, you know, that company has operations all over the place. Um, but if, if history is any guide, Intel is going to roll Move It into their Israel-based R&D center. Intel, a huge American company, is one of, if not the largest private sector employer in Israel. And they will likely hire more people and grow the footprint of Move It, just like Google did with Waze, um, just like a lot of other, um, you know, is, uh, 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 American companies have done when they uh, when they acquire um, an Israeli uh, an Israeli company. So you find that um, typically, as these companies expand more in the U.S., as these companies expand more, um, uh, you know, all over the world, and they raise more money, they have U.S. investors. They're growing that footprint in Israel. I know because I'm on the board of BioCatch. You know, we just raised $145 million, um, led by Bain, um, joined by Goldman Sachs, some of the biggest players in 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 global finance. Um, you know, our hiring plans over the next 18 months are 70% in Israel. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just want to make sure that people realize that as good things happen for these companies on the global stage, their footprint in Israel typically gets gets bigger. So we have a question here from Galina Datskovsky. What are the names of the contact, uh, the contact tracing software company and the predictive company that calls out the next hotspot? Um, and which countries and states are adopting these types of technologies? So first of all, I think that if, if Galina is uh, uh, relating to the, uh, to the Hamagen, 
and the Shield. So this is an open source uh, platform that was developed by the ministry, the Israeli Ministry of Health. And this is, as, as it's an open source, every organization could actually uh, download it and use by, 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 by its uh, specific uh, purposes and adapt it to, to, to whatever they need in order to make it uh, efficient. One of, the, one of the companies that were mentioned is uh, Cellbrite. As far as I remember, they, are, they have been operating already uh, within, in, in, in 10 countries. And in regarding to the predictive uh, platform, this is a platform of the uh, Weizmann Institute. Uh, we can uh, send you after the link, uh, Yael, but uh, I'm sure you will find it also on the website of uh, the Weizmann Institute. Uh, so our next question um, is actually a little bit more geared towards Gan Daniel. Uh, it's from Juli Julio Snikovsky. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your successful investments that you've made in Israel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've been uh, we've been blessed. We've been active in the Israeli ecosystem for about ten years now. Um, we have uh, twenty seven portfolio companies. Um, we've referenced BioCatch, so I'll just give you guys a quick overview of that one because it's been in the news lately. Um, but this is a company that we seeded in Tel Aviv back in 2011. Um, and back then, they were looking at disrupting how banks um, uh, authenticate and understand the identity of their users, moving us to a, a place where we wouldn't have to use usernames and passwords. Um, because, you know, a username and a password is information that I can steal from you. Um, and there's so many great ways to do that. I don't know if any of you are active on social media now, but you see all these polls where people are, are bored. So they're answering questions like what year they graduated from high school, what their high school mascot was, what their favorite food is, what their favorite vacation is. Well, they may as well be also answering the questions of what is your mother's maiden name? Uh, what is the street address that you grew up on? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the, uh, the amount of trolling that goes on today to obtain the ability to use information to steal all of your stuff. What BioCatch does is they look at the unique movements that you make um, on a mouse or a trackpad by looking at how your finger goes across the screen. Um, do you click in the center of something? Do you click on the top right of something? Do you move quickly? Do you move slowly? Are your movements pretty jerky or are they not? Uh, and they're looking at all of the things about your human behavioral movements that actually authenticate you. Um, for, example, if you for example, if you're filling out a credit card application, um, the typical authentic user for a credit card application takes a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and when you're inputting your social security number, you do it with one gesture because you know those, you know those numbers. Um, a fraudster, for example, takes um, a break, a one second break between digit three and digit four of your social security number because they're clicking back and forth between a spreadsheet to copy it from a whole list of stolen secure, social security numbers. Oh, and by the way, they complete the application in about half the time of an authentic user because they do 300 at once. Um, so they know the application, they know how it works. So by understanding human behavioral biometrics, um, you actually can create a much better level of security. So um, this is a company that we seeded in 2011. It was two guys and, uh, and an idea. Um, fast forward to today, um, as was mentioned, they just closed a $145 million funding round um, they have uh, significant nine-digit revenue numbers. They protect 100 million banking customers every day um, with uh, uh, most of the top 25 global financial institutions as their clients. Um, this was basically a team that came out of the 8200 intelligence unit that had built sort of a similar system in the army. Um, we have a, a, another portfolio company of ours that was acquired last year, a company called Presenso. Um, they do um, uh, uh, sort of predictive maintenance and analytics for um, large industrials. Um, so they were acquired by a Swedish industrial company called SKF that's using Presenso's technology um, to actually chart machine degradation and making sure that they eliminate downtime for their customers. They also used Presenso's team to open up um, the first of its kind Israel uh, sort of R&D center for, for, for SKF. 
um, which I mentioned is, 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 is a Swedish company. Um, we have another company that um, is a company called CoraLogics. Um, they're in an, a space called DevOps. Um, they basically are doing predictive maintenance for software. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried to buy a, a plane ticket and you press buy and it takes you to an error screen or you pressed play on a video and it doesn't play. Um, that's a breakage in your backend IT system. Um, imagine if you had a layer sitting on the back end of that IT system um, that is basically looking into the future at when these breakdowns may occur and fixing them proactively so that they don't become customer facing. Uh, the last time you tried to book a United Airlines flight and it didn't work, you probably didn't call United. You probably didn't call YouTube when your, uh, when your video didn't play. Um, you don't wanna have these issues um, affecting um, you know, your customers. So uh, they just raised a, um, a $10 million Series A from um, our, our friends at Aleph VC. I don't know, you've had Michael Eisenberg a few times. So he's our co-investor in, uh, in, in this company, CoraLogics. Um, I, 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 uh, thankfully, I could, um, I could go on. Um, we have a, a number of, of very successful portfolio companies. We also have um, some that didn't work, uh, as, is, uh, as is the case. But um, uh, it's, it's incredible to have a front row seat to these Israeli technologies that have these U.S.-centric customer bases um, and are truly um, impacting how these U.S. enterprises are delivering their products to everyday Americans.